Book twenty one, chapters fourteen to twenty eight of Commentaries on the Gallic War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translation by Thomas Rice Holmes. Chapter fourteen. Having sustained these successive disasters, at Valonodunum, Cenabum, and Noviodunum, Vercingetorix called his followers to a council. He told them that the campaign must thenceforward be conducted on widely different lines. The object was by every means to prevent the Romans from foraging and getting supplies. This object could easily be attained, for their side was strong in cavalry, and the season was in their favour. No grass could be cut. The enemy must perforce disperse and get fodder from the barns, and the cavalry could destroy all these detachments from day to day. Moreover, in the public interest, personal convenience must be disregarded. All round the road, as far as the country was accessible for forage, the hamlets and homesteads should be burned. They were well off for supplies themselves, as they could draw upon the resources of the people whose territory was the theatre of the war but the Romans would either succumb to their privations or would have to move far from their camp, at great risk, and it made no difference whether they killed them or took their baggage, for, if it were lost, they could not keep the field. Moreover, it would be well to burn those towns which were not rendered impregnable by fortification and a naturally strong position, for fear they should serve their own side as refuges for shirking military duty and tempt the Romans to pillage them and plunder their stores. If this sounded hard or cruel, they should consider how much harder it was for their wives and children to be carried off into slavery while they were themselves put to death, and if they were beaten, this would be inevitable. Chapter 15 This view was unanimously approved, and in a single day more than twenty towns belonging to the Bituriges were set ablaze. The same thing happened in the territories of the other tribes. The whole country was a scene of conflagration and although all felt this a grievous trial, they consoled themselves with the assurance that victory was practically in their grasp, and that they would soon recover what they had lost. The question was debated in a general assembly, whether Avaricum should be burned or defended. The Bituriges knelt before their countrymen, begging that they might not be forced to fire with their own hands the town which was well nigh the finest in the whole of Gaul, the bulwark and the pride of their people. It was naturally so strong that they would easily defend it, for it was almost entirely surrounded by running water and marshy ground, and could only be approached at one place, which was very narrow. Their prayer was granted. Vercingetorix at first opposed them, but afterwards gave way, in deference to their entreaties and the general sympathy that was shown them. Capable officers were selected to defend the town. Chapter 16 Vercingetorix following Caesar by easy stages, selected for his encampment a spot, protected by marshes and woods, sixteen miles from Avaricum. He early kept himself informed, by organised patrols, of what was going on at Avaricum, and issued his orders accordingly. He watched all our expeditions for forage and corn, attacked our men when they were scattered, for they were obliged to go far afield, and inflicted on them considerable loss, although they took every precaution that ingenuity could devise to baffle him, starting at odd times and in different directions. Chapter 17 Caesar encamped on the side of the town which, as we have mentioned above, was undefended by running water and marshy ground, and was approached by a narrow neck of land. As the lie of the country made it impossible to invest the position, he proceeded to build a terrace, form lines of sheds, and erect two towers. He urged the Boi and the Edui unceasingly to keep him supplied with grain, but the latter, being half-hearted, were of little service, while the former, a small and feeble tribe, whose resources were slender, soon used up what they had. Owing to the poverty of the Boi, and the slackness of the Edui, and the burning of the granaries, the army was in the greatest straits for supplies, insomuch that for several days the men were without grain and only kept famine at bay by driving in the cattle from distant villages. Yet not a word were they heard to utter unworthy of the majesty of the Roman people, and their own record of victory. Nor was this all. 
Caesar spoke to the legions singly while they were at work, and told them that, if they found their privations too hard to bear, he would abandon the siege. But with one voice they begged him not to do so. They had served under his command for several years without disgrace, and had never abandoned any operation which they had undertaken. They would feel it a disgrace to abandon the siege, having once begun it, and it was better to put up with every hardship than fail in avenging the Romans who had fallen at Cenabum by Gallic treachery. They said the same to the centurions and tribunes, charging them to repeat it to Caesar. Chapter 18 The towers were now getting close to the wall. Caesar learned from prisoners that Vercingetorix, having consumed his provender, had moved closer to Avaricum, and gone off himself with his cavalry and the light-armed foot who regularly fight along with the cavalry, intending to lie in ambush at the spot where he believed that our men would go to forage on the following day. Acting on this information, Caesar started quietly at midnight and reached the enemy's encampment in the morning. They were informed of his approach by their patrols and, swiftly removing their carts and baggage into the densest part of the woods, drew up all their forces on open rising ground. On receiving this report, Caesar ordered the troops to pile their packs promptly and get their arms ready. Chapter 19 The hill sloped gently upward from its base, and was almost entirely surrounded by holding marshy ground, difficult to cross, but not more than fifty feet wide. The Gauls had broken down the causeways and remained obstinately on the hill, confident in the strength of the position, formed up in tribal groups, they held all the fords and the thickets that bordered the marsh, determined, if the Romans attempted to force a passage, to attack them from their commanding position while they were bogged in the slush. Seeing the proximity of the two forces, one would have thought that the Gauls were ready to fight and that the chances were nearly even. But anyone who detected the disparity in the conditions would have known that their defiant attitude was mere bravado. The legionaries, indignant that the enemy behind that paltry barrier, had the hardihood to look them in the face, clamoured for the signal for action. But Caesar made them understand that victory could only be gained at a heavy cost, and by the sacrifice of many brave men. He could see that for his honour their hearts were steeled to face any peril, and for that reason he should deserve to be called the most heartless of men if he did not hold their lives dearer than his own reputation. In this way he soothed the men's feelings and, leading them back the same day to camp, proceeded to complete his arrangements for the siege of the town. Chapter 20. Vercingetorix, on returning to his troops, was accused of treachery. The charge was that he had moved nearer the Romans, that he had taken all the cavalry with him, that he had left his numerous forces without a head, and that on his departure the Romans had rapidly advanced at the opportune moment. These things could not have happened by accident. They must have been deliberately planned, and evidently he would rather reign over Gaul as Caesar's creature than by the favour of his countrymen. In reply to these charges, Vercingetorix said that if he had shifted his camp, he had done so because forage was scarce, and at their own instigation. If he had moved nearer to the Romans, it was because he was attracted by a favourable position, whose natural features were its own defence, while cavalry ought not to have been required on marshy ground, and were useful in the place to which they had actually gone. When he left them, he had deliberately refrained from delegating the command to anyone, for fear his substitute might be driven by the impetuosity of the host to flight, for he could see that that was what they all wanted, because they were infirm of purpose and incapable of prolonged exertion. If the arrival of the Romans in his absence was accidental, they ought to thank fortune. If they had come on the invitation of a spy, they ought to thank him for having enabled them to ascertain from their commanding position the smallness of their numbers, and to see how despicable was the spirit of men who dared not fight, but slunk back ignominiously to their camp. For himself, he did not want to get from Caesar by treachery a power which he could secure by victory, victory which was already in his grasp and in that of the whole Gallic people. No, he would give them back their gift if they imagined that they were conferring a favour upon him, instead of owing their safety to him. To satisfy yourselves, he continued, that what I say is true, listen to Roman soldiers. He made some slaves step forward, whom he had captured foraging a few days before, and had kept in chains on starvation diet. 
They had been carefully taught beforehand what to say when questioned. They said that they were legionaries. Hunger and want had led them to steal out of camp to see whether they could find any corn or cattle in the fields. The whole army was in the same straits, and not a man was now strong enough to stand the strain of his daily work. The general had therefore resolved to withdraw the army in three days, unless he made some real progress in the siege of the town. These benefits, said Vercingetorix, you owe to me, me whom you falsely accuse of treachery. Thanks to my efforts, without shedding a drop of your blood, you see this mighty, this victorious army well nigh starved, and I have taken care of that. When it seeks safety in ignominious flight, not one tribe shall grant it refuge. Chapter 21 The whole multitude cheered loudly and clashed their weapons in the native fashion, for Gauls generally do this when they are pleased with what an orator says. Vercingetorix, they declared, was the greatest of leaders. His loyalty was above suspicion, and it was impossible to carry on the war with greater judgment. They determined to throw ten thousand men, selected from all the contingents, into the town, not thinking it wise to trust the national safety to the Bituriges alone. For they realized that if the Bituriges succeeded in holding the town, the whole victory would be theirs. Chapter 22 the extraordinary valour of our soldiers found its match in the manifold devices of the Gauls, for they are a most ingenious people, and always show the greatest aptitude in borrowing and giving effect to ideas which they get from any one. They pulled aside the grappling hooks with nooses, and when they had got hold of them, hauled them inside the town by means of windlasses. They also undermined and dragged away the material of the terrace, performing the operation very adroitly, because there are large iron mines in their country and they are thoroughly familiar with every kind of underground gallery. Moreover, they had covered the whole wall at every point with towers, provided with platforms and protected by hides. Again, they made frequent sorties by day and night, setting fire to the terrace or attacking the troops at their work, as the terrace, daily rising, raised our towers to a higher level, they lashed together the uprights of their own towers and gave them a corresponding elevation and opening into the Roman mines, they prevented them, with beams sharpened and hardened in the fire, boiling pitch, and heavy stones from approaching the wall. Chapter 23 Gallic walls are always constructed on the following or some similar plan. Bulks of timber are laid upon the ground at right angles to the line of the intended wall, and in unbroken succession along its length, at regular intervals of two feet. These bulks are made fast on the inner side, and thickly coated with rubble, while the intervals above mentioned are tightly packed in front with large stones. When the bulks are fixed in their places and fastened together, a fresh row is laid on the top of them in such a way that the same interval is kept, and the bulks do not touch each other, but are separated by similar intervals, into each of which a stone is thrust, and thus are kept firmly in position. Thus, step by step, the whole fabric is constructed until the wall reaches its proper height. While the structure, with its alternate bulks and stones, which preserve their regular succession in straight lines, presents a variegated aspect which is not unsightly, it is also extremely serviceable and adapted for the defence of towns, for the stone secures it against fire, and the woodwork, which is braced on the inner side, by beams generally forty feet long running right across, and so can neither be broken through nor pulled to pieces, protects it against the ram. Chapter 24 All the above-mentioned causes impeded the siege, and the men were hampered all the time by cold and continual rain. Yet by unremitting toil they overcame all these difficulties, and in twenty-five days erected a terrace three hundred and thirty feet broad and eighty feet high. The terrace was almost in contact with the enemy's wall, and Caesar was, as usual, bivouacking at the works, urging the men not to suspend labour for a moment, when, a little before the third watch, it was noticed that the terrace was smoking. The enemy had undermined and set it on fire. At the same moment a cheer arose all along the wall, and troops came pouring out of the two gates on either side of the towers, while others flung down torches and dry wood from their commanding position on the wall onto the terrace, and shot pitch and other inflammable material, so that it was scarcely possible to decide where to strike a counter-blow, or what point to reinforce. 
but caesar's practice was to have two legions regularly bivouacking in front of the camp while a larger number which took duty in turns were constantly at work so that a number of men soon checked the sortie while others drew back the towers and dragged asunder the timbers of the terrace and the whole multitude from the camp came thronging to extinguish the flames chapter twenty five the rest of the night passed by and still the fight was going on at every point the enemy's hope of victory continually revived for they saw that the breastworks of the towers were burnt and that it was not easy to advance and support a threatened position without cover in their own ranks fresh men were continually relieving those who were tired and they felt that on that moment depended the salvation of gaul just then we witnessed an episode which seemed worthy of remembrance and we have therefore thought ought not to be passed over a gaul standing in front of one of the gates of the town was throwing lumps of fat and pitch passed to him from hand to hand into the fire opposite one of the towers a bolt from a small catapult pierced him on the right side and he dropped dead one of the men nearest him stepped across his prostrate body and continued the work a shot from the catapult killed him in the same way and a third man took his place and a fourth the place of the third nor was the post abandoned by the defenders until the fire on the terrace was put out the enemy everywhere repulsed and the fighting at an end chapter twenty six the gauls had tried every expedient and next day as nothing had succeeded they took the urgent advice of vercingetorix and determined to escape from the town by making the attempt in the stillness of night they hoped to succeed without much loss for vercingetorix's camp was not far from the town and the continuous marsh which intervened would make it difficult for the romans to pursue it was night and they were preparing for their attempt when suddenly the matrons came running into the open and weeping and flinging themselves at their husbands feet passionately entreated them not to give them up and the children who were their common possession to the tender mercies of the enemy for natural bodily weakness prevented them from making their escape when they saw that their resolve was immovable for often in extremity of peril fear leaves no room for compassion they began to scream and gesticulate to warn the romans of the intended flight the gauls were terrified by this fearing that the roman cavalry would seize the roads and abandon their resolve chapter twenty seven next day caesar advanced one of his towers and the works which he had begun were completed a heavy storm of rain came on and he thought the opportunity a good one for maturing his plans observing that the guards were rather carelessly posted on the wall he ordered his own men to go about their work with a show of listlessness and explained his intention the legions unobserved got ready for action under the cover of the sheds caesar told them that now was the moment to repay themselves for the herculean toils and grasp the prize of victory and offering rewards to the men who should first mount the wall he gave the troops the signal suddenly they darted forth from every point and swiftly lined the wall chapter twenty eight the enemy panic-stricken by this unexpected move were driven from the wall and towers but formed in wedge-shaped masses in the market-place and open spaces determined if they were attacked to fight it out shoulder to shoulder seeing that no one would come down on to the level but that men were swarming all along the wall on every side they feared that all chance of escape would be gone and flinging away their arms made a rush for the furthest quarter of the town there some of them jostling one another in the narrow gateways were slaughtered by the infantry and others after they had got clear of the gates by the cavalry not a man wrecked of plunder exasperated by the massacre at kenavum and the toil of the siege they spared not the aged nor women nor children of the entire garrison numbering about forty thousand a bare eight hundred who had fled precipitately from the town on hearing the first outcry escaped unhurt to vercingetorix late at night he received the fugitives in silence fearing that as they came thronging in the sympathies of the host might be aroused and a riot ensue in the camp he stationed his trusted associates and the tribal leaders some distance off on the road and had the fugitives conveyed separately to join their comrades in the section of the camp which had been allotted originally to each tribe end of chapter twenty eight
Book seven, chapters twenty nine to forty one of Commentaries on the Gallic War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book Seven, Chapter Twenty Nine. Next day he called a council of war and consoled his followers, bidding them not be unduly disheartened or disquieted by the disaster. The Romans had not beaten them by superior courage or in a fair fight, but by a kind of trickery and by their knowledge of siege work, of which they themselves had no experience. It was a mistake to expect invariable success in war. They could testify that he had never approved of defending Avaricum. This reverse was due to the short-sightedness of the Bituriges and the undue complacence of the other tribes. However, he would soon repair it by successes greater still. By good management he would gain over the dissentient tribes and make the whole of Gaul of one mind, and when Gaul was united, the whole world could not stand against her. This object, indeed, he had already nearly attained. Meanwhile he had a right to expect, in the name of the common weal, that they would take to fortifying their camps, so as to withstand sudden attacks more readily. CHAPTER Thirty. This speech made a good impression upon the Gauls. What pleased them most was that, despite a signal disaster, Vercingetorix had not lost heart, or concealed himself, or shrunk from facing the multitude. And they gave him all the more credit for foresight and prescience, because, before the event, he had voted, first for the burning of Avaricum and afterwards for its abandonment. And so, while a reverse weakens the authority of commanders in general, his prestige, on the contrary, in consequence of the disaster, waxed daily greater. At the same time, relying upon his assurance, they entertained the hope of gaining over the other tribes. Gauls now for the first time began to fortify their camps, and they were so thoroughly frightened that, unused though they were to labour, they felt constrained to submit to every order. Chapter 31 Vercingetorix was as good as his word, and exercised his ingenuity to gain over the other tribes, tempting their chiefs by presents and offers of reward. He chose agents qualified for the purpose, selecting them for the persuasive power which they could severally exercise by plausible speech or good fellowship. He made it his business to provide those who had escaped on the fall of Avaricum with arms and clothing. At the same time, in order to make good his losses, he levied a definite number of recruits from the tribes, fixing the strength of each contingent and the date by which he required them to arrive at headquarters. And he gave orders that all the archers in Gaul, a very numerous body, should be searched for and sent to him. By these measures the losses at Avaricum were speedily repaired. Meanwhile, Teutomatus, son of Olovico, king of the Nitiobroges, whose father had received from our senate the title of friend, joined him with a large body of his own cavalry, and of others from Aquitania, whom he had hired. Chapter 32 Caesar remained several days at Avaricum, where he found an abundance of grain and other stores, and thus enabled the army to recover from their labour and privation. Winter was now nearly over. The propitious season bade him take the field, and he had determined to march against the enemy in the hopes of being able to lure him out of the marshes and forests, or to keep him under close blockade, when the Aeduan magnates came as envoys to beg him to help their country in a serious emergency. The situation, they pleaded, was extremely critical. From remote antiquity the chief magistrates had regularly been appointed one at a time and held sovereign power for one year. Now, however, there were two in office, each of whom asserted that his appointment was legal. One of them was Convictio Litavis, a young man of influence and distinction, the other Cotus, a scion of a very old family, and moreover a man of commanding position and powerful family connections, whose brother, Valetiacus, had held the same office in the preceding year. The people were up in arms, the council and the commonality were divided, and the rivals were each supported by their own retainers. 
if the dispute were prolonged, the result would be civil war. It rested with Caesar to prevent this by his energy and influence. Chapter 33 Caesar considered it detrimental to leave the theatre of war and suspend his operations against the enemy. But he was aware that great disasters commonly arise from civil strife. The Aedui were a powerful tribe, bound by the closest ties to the Roman people. He had always promoted their interests and distinguished them by every mark of favour, and he regarded it as his first duty to prevent them from coming to blows, and the weaker party from applying for aid to Vercingetorix. As the holder of the chief magistracy was forbidden by Eduan law to leave the country, he determined, in order to avoid the semblance of slighting their rights or their laws, to go in person to their country, and accordingly summoned the whole council and the disputants themselves to meet him at Decetia. There almost all the citizens of note assembled. Caesar was informed that a few persons had been secretly called together, and that one of the rivals had been declared elected by his own brother, in a wrong place and at a wrong time, whereas the law not only forbade two members of one family to be appointed while both were alive, but actually prohibited them from sitting in the council. He therefore compelled Cotus to resign, and authorised Convictor Litavis, who had been appointed by the priests in accordance with tribal custom in a period of interregnum, to continue to hold office. Chapter 34 Having stopped the dispute by this decision, Caesar counselled the Aedui to forget their disputes and dissensions, and, putting aside everything else, to devote themselves to the campaign, and look forward to receiving from him the reward which would be their due when Gaul was finally conquered. They were to send him quickly the whole of their cavalry and ten thousand foot, that he might distribute them for the protection of his convoys. He then divided the army into two parts. Assigning part of the cavalry to Labienus and retaining the rest, he gave him four legions, with which he was to march against the Senones and the Parisii, and advanced in person at the head of the remaining six towards the country of the Arverni, in the direction of the stronghold of Gergovia, following the course of the Allia. On learning this, Vercingetorix broke down all the bridges over the river, and marched up the opposite bank. Chapter 35 The two armies were in full view of one another, and each encamped almost opposite the camp of the other. Patrols were thrown out to prevent the Romans from making a bridge anywhere and throwing their troops across. And thus Caesar was in a very difficult position, for he was in danger of being barred by the river for the greater part of the summer, as the Allia is not generally fordable before the autumn. To prevent this, he encamped in a wooded spot opposite one of the bridges which Vercingetorix had broken down, and next day remained there in concealment with two legions. The rest of the force he sent on as usual with all the baggage, breaking up some of the cohorts, so that the number of the legions might appear unchanged. He ordered them to march on as far as possible, and when he inferred from the time of day that they had reached camp, he proceeded to repair the bridge, making use of the original piles, the lower part of which were still entire. The work was rapidly finished, the legions crossed over, and, selecting a suitable spot for his camp, he recalled the other troops. When Vercingetorix found out what had happened, he pushed on ahead by forced marches, in order to avoid being compelled to fight against his will. Chapter 36 From the point where he had halted, Caesar made his way to Gergovia in five marches. On the day of his arrival, a cavalry skirmish took place. The town, situated upon a lofty hill, was difficult to access on all sides. After making a reconnaissance, Caesar concluded that a regular siege would be hopeless, and he resolved not to attempt a blockade until he had secured his supplies. Vercingetorix had encamped near the town and grouped the contingents of the several tribes at moderate distances from one another and round his own quarters. His force occupied all the high points of the mountain mass, commanding a view over the plain, and presented a formidable appearance. He ordered the tribal chieftains, whom he had chosen to share his counsels, to come to him every morning at daybreak, to communicate intelligence or make arrangements for the defence, 
and there was hardly a day on which he missed sending his cavalry into action, with archers scattered among their ranks, so as to test the metal and the soldierly qualities of every man. Opposite the town, and at the very foot of the mountain, there was a hill of great natural strength and scarped on every side. If our troops could occupy it, they would probably be able to cut off the enemy from principal source of their water supply, and harass their foragers. But they held the place, though with an inadequate force. Notwithstanding, Caesar moved out of his camp in the stillness of night, and before relief could arrive from the town, expelled the garrison, took possession of the place, and posted two legions to hold it. From the larger camp to the smaller, he drew a pair of trenches, each twelve feet broad, to enable the men to come and go, even one at a time, secure from any sudden attack. Chapter 37 While these events were passing at Gergovia, Convictor Litavis, the Aeduan, upon whom, as we have related, Caesar had conferred the chief magistracy, was bribed by the Arverni to join them. He communicated with a number of young men, the most prominent of whom were Litavicus and his brothers, who belonged to a very illustrious family. Sharing the money with them, he urged them to bear in mind that they were free men, born to command. The Aedui, and they alone, prevented Gaul from making sure of success. Their influence kept the other tribes in check, and if it were thrown into the opposite scale, the Romans would have no footing in Gaul. Personally, he was under some obligation to Caesar, though he had fully deserved to win his case, but obligation was outweighed by regard for the national liberty. Why, indeed, should the Aedui submit their rights and laws to the arbitration of Caesar any more than the Romans to that of the Aedui? The young men were speedily won by the magistrate's eloquence, and his gold, and promised even to take the lead in his enterprise, and they tried to think of some method of accomplishing it, feeling doubtful whether the community could be lightly induced to embark on war. It was decided that Litavicus should take command of the ten thousand who were to be sent to Caesar to take part in the campaign, and undertake the duty of leading them, and that his brothers should hurry on in advance to join Caesar. At the same time, they arranged the rest of their program. Chapter 38 Litavicus took command of the army. About thirty miles from Gergovia, he suddenly paraded the troops. Soldiers, he said with a burst of tears, where are we going? All our cavalry, all our men of rank have perished. Two of our leading citizens, Eporedorix and Viridomarus, have been falsely charged with treason and put to death by the Romans without trial. Learn the facts from these men who have fled straight from the massacre. For my brothers and all my kinsfolk are slain, and grief prevents me from telling what has happened. Some men whom he had schooled in their parts came forward and repeated to the host the tale which Litavicus had told. All the Eduan cavalry, they said, had been massacred on the rumour that they had been in communication with the Arverni. They had themselves hidden in the crowd of soldiers and escaped from the midst of the slaughter. With one voice the Edui adjured Litavicus to consider their safety. As if, he cried, it were a case for consideration, as if we were not bound to hurry on to Gergovia and join the Arverni. Can we doubt that the Romans, after the shameful deed they have done, are even now hastening to slay us? Therefore, if we have a spark of courage in us, let us avenge the deaths of our countrymen, who have been most foully murdered, and kill these brigands. Then, pointing to some Roman citizens who had accompanied him in reliance upon his escort, he seized a quantity of corn and other stores belonging to them, cruelly tortured them, and put them to death. Sending messengers throughout the length and breadth of the Eduan territory, he stirred up the populace by the same lying tale of the massacre of cavalry and chiefs, and urged them to follow his example, and avenge their wrongs. Chapter 39 Eporidorix a young Aeduan of noble birth and commanding influence in his own country, and Viridomarus, a man of the same age and equally popular but of lower birth, had been summoned expressly by Caesar, and had taken the field with the cavalry. Diviciacus had recommended Viridomarus to Caesar, and Caesar had raised him from a humble position to the highest dignity. He and Eporidorix were rivals for power, and in the struggle between the magistrates, 
Aperodorics had been a strong partisan of Convicto Litavis, and Viridomarus of Cotus. On learning Litavicus's design, Eporodorix went to Caesar about midnight and told him the story. He begged him not to suffer the tribe to fall away from its friendship with the Roman people through the misguided counsels of raw youths, telling him that he foresaw that this would happen if such a numerous force joined the enemy, for their kinsmen could not disregard their safety, or the tribe treat it as insignificant. Chapter 40 The news caused Caesar great anxiety for he had always shown a special favour to the Eduan community. Without a moment's hesitation, therefore, he left camp at the head of four legions in light marching order, and the whole of the cavalry. There was no time at such a crisis to reduce the size of the camp, for success plainly depended upon prompt action, and he left Gaius Fabius to guard it with two legions. He ordered Litavicus's brothers to be arrested, but found that they had escaped to the enemy a short time before. Addressing the men, he urged them not to mind a hard march at so critical a conjuncture. They were all in great heart, and after a march of twenty-five miles, Caesar descried the Aeduan column, and, sending on his cavalry, delayed and finally stopped their advance, at the same time strictly forbidding all ranks to kill a single man, and telling Eporodorix and Viridomarus, who were supposed by the Aedui to have been killed, to move about among the troopers and speak to their countrymen. As soon as they were recognized, and the Aedui saw that Litavicus had deceived them, they stretched out their hands in token of surrender, grounding their arms and begging for their lives. Litavicus escaped to Gergovia, accompanied by his retainers, for Gallic custom brands it as shameful for retainers to desert their lords, even when all is lost. Chapter 41 Caesar sent messengers to the Aedui to explain that, as an act of favour, he had spared men whom the rights of war would have entitled him to put to death, and after giving the army three hours in the night to rest, he moved on towards Gergovia. About half-way, some horsemen, sent by Fabius, met him, and reported that the camp had been in imminent danger. The entire force of the enemy, they said, had attacked it, fresh men frequently relieving their comrades when they were tired and wearing out our troops by incessant toil, as, on account of its great extent, they had to keep constantly on the rampart without relief. Many had been wounded by showers of arrows and missiles of every kind, but the artillery had been of great use in enabling them to hold out. When the enemy retired, Fabius was blocking up all the gates except two, strengthening the rampart with breastworks, and preparing to meet a similar attack on the morrow. On receiving this intelligence, Caesar pushed on, and, thanks to the extraordinary energy of the men, reached camp before sunrise. End of chapter 41。Book 7, chapters 42 to 51 of Commentaries on the Gallic War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translation by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book 7, Chapter 42. While these events were passing at Gergovia, the Aedui received Litavicus's first message. Leaving themselves no time to find out the truth, they were impelled, some by greed, others by anger and rashness, an innate quality of the race, to take an idle rumour for an ascertained fact. They plundered Roman citizens, murdered them, kidnapped and enslaved them. Convictor Litavis added fuel to the flame, and hounded on the masses to frenzy, in the hope that, once committed, they would feel ashamed to return to reason. Marcus Aristius, a military tribune, was on his way to join his legion. They promised him a safe conduct, and made him quit the town of Cavillonum, compelling the Romans who had settled there for trade to depart also. Forthwith they fell upon them on the road, and robbed them of all their baggage. The Romans resisted, and their assailants beset them all day and the following night. Many were killed on both sides, 
and the assailants roused numbers to arm. Chapter 43. Meanwhile, news arrived that all their infantry were in Caesar's power. Hurrying to Aristius, they explained that the government was not responsible for anything, and ordering an inquiry about the plundered property, they confiscated the goods of Litavicus and his brothers, and sent envoys to make their excuses to Caesar. Their motive was to get their countrymen restored, but, stained with crime, fascinated by the profits of plunder, for many had had a hand in the outrages, and dreading retribution, they began to make secret preparations for war, and sent embassies to gain over the other tribes. Caesar was aware of their designs. Nevertheless, he spoke to their envoys with all possible gentleness, assuring them that he would not judge the whole people harshly because of the ignorant folly of the masses, or abate his good will towards the Aedui. Anticipating that the insurrection in Gaul would spread, and desiring to avoid being surrounded by all the tribes, he began to think out a plan for withdrawing from the neighbourhood of Gergovia, and once more concentrating the whole army in such a way that his departure might not be attributed to fear of a general defection and resemble a flight. Chapter 44 While he was meditating on this problem, he thought he saw an opportunity of striking a telling blow. Going to the smaller camp to inspect the works, he noticed that a hill in the possession of the enemy was completely deserted, whereas before it could hardly be discerned for their number. In astonishment, he inquired of the deserters, who daily flocked to join him in great numbers, what was the reason. They were all agreed, and Caesar had already found out the same thing for himself through his patrols, that the ridge to which the hill belonged was nearly level, but where it gave access to the further side of the town, wooded and narrow. The Gauls were intensely anxious for the safety of this place, and one hill being already held by the Romans, they now felt sure that if they lost the other, they would be all but surrounded, fairly cut off from all egress, and prevented from foraging. Every man, therefore, had been called away by Vercingetorix to fortify the position. Chapter 45 On learning this, Caesar sent several squadrons of cavalry thither about midnight, ordering them to rove all over the country and make a good deal of noise. At daybreak he ordered a large number of pack-horses and mules to be taken out of camp, the pack-saddles to be taken off, and the drivers to put on helmets, so as to look like troopers, and ride round over the hills. He sent a few regular cavalry with them, with orders to wander further afield, so as to increase the effect. All were to make a wide circuit and head towards the same goal. These movements could be seen far off from the town, as Gergovia commanded a view of the camp, but it was impossible at such a distance to make out exactly what they meant. A single legion was sent along the same chain, and after it had advanced a little way it was stationed on lower ground and concealed in the woods. The suspicions of the Gauls were intensified, and they transferred all their forces to the threatened point to help in the work of fortification. Noticing that the enemy's camps were deserted, Caesar made his soldiers cover their crests and hide their standards, and move, a few at a time, to avoid being observed from the town, from the larger to the smaller camp. At the same time he explained his plans to his generals, each of whom he had placed in command of a legion, warning them above all to keep the men in hand, and not let them advance too far from over-eagerness for fighting or lust for plunder. He pointed out that this unfavourable ground placed them at a disadvantage, which could only be avoided by moving quickly. It was a case for a surprise, not a regular battle. Having made these instructions clear, he gave the signal, at the same time sending the Aedui up the hill by another path on the right. Chapter 46 The wall of the town was nine furlongs in a straight line from the plain, where the ascent began, without reckoning any bend. The turns that were necessary for easing the slope added so much to the length of the climb. About halfway up, running lengthways in the direction indicated by the formation of the mountain, the Gauls had built a wall six feet high of large stones to check any attack by our men. All the space below was left unoccupied, but the higher part of the hill, up to the wall of the town, was thickly covered by their camps. When the signal was given, the men rapidly gained the outer line of defence, clambered over it, and took possession of three camps. 
They did this so quickly that Teutomatus, king of the Nitiobroges, was surprised in his tent where he was taking his siesta, and only just broke away, naked to the waist and with his horse wounded, from the clutches of the plundering soldiers. Chapter 47 Having achieved his purpose, Caesar ordered the recall to be sounded, and immediately halted the tenth legion, which he commanded in person. The men of the other legions did not hear the sound of the trumpet, as a considerable valley intervened, till the tribunes and the generals, in obedience to Caesar's command, tried to keep them in hand. Elated, however, by the expectation of a speedy triumph, by the enemy's flight, and by the recollection of past victories, they fancied that nothing was too difficult for their valour to achieve, and pressed on in pursuit till they got close to the wall and gates of the fortress. Then a cry arose from every part of the town, and those who were some way off, panic-stricken by the sudden uproar, and believing that the enemy were inside the gates, rushed pell-mell out of the stronghold. Matrons flung down clothes and money from the wall, and leaning over with breasts bare, stretched forth their hands and besought the Romans to spare them, and not to refuse quarter even to women and children, as they had done at Avaricum, while some were let down from the walls and gave themselves up to the soldiers. Lucius Fabius, a centurion of the Eighth Legion, who was known to have said that day, in the hearing of his men, that he was fired by the recollection of the rewards that had been offered at Avaricum, and would suffer no man to mount the wall before him, got three men of his company, and, being hoisted up by them, clambered up the wall, then in turn hauling them up one by one, he lifted them on to it. Chapter 48 Meanwhile the men who, as we have pointed out above, had assembled near the other end of the town to fortify the position, heard the outcry, and presently, stimulated by a succession of messages telling them that the town was in the hands of the Romans, sent on horsemen ahead and hurried up at a great pace. Each man, as he successively arrived, took his stand under the wall and swelled the number of his comrades. And now a great multitude had assembled, and the matrons, who a moment before had been holding out their hands to the Romans from the wall, began to adjure their menfolk, and displayed their streaming locks, as Gallic women do, and brought out their children for all to see. It was no fair fight for the Romans. The ground was unfavourable, their numbers were inferior, and tired out by their rapid climb and the protracted combat, they could not well hold their own against men who had just come fresh into action. Chapter 49 Caesar, seeing that the fight was not on a fair field, and that the enemy's force was increasing, became anxious for the safety of his men, and sent an order to Titus Sextius, the general whom he had left in charge of the smaller camp, to take his cohorts out quickly, and form them up at the foot of the hill, on the enemy's right flank so as to check their pursuit in case he saw our men driven from their position. Advancing a little with his own legion from the position which he had taken up, he awaited the issue of the combat. Fierce fighting was going on, the enemy relying upon position and numbers. Our men upon valour, when suddenly the Edui, whom Caesar had sent out by another path on the right to create a diversion, were descried on our exposed flank. Being armed like Gauls, they caused a violent panic among our men, and although it was noticed that their right shoulders were bare, the recognised symbol of peace, yet the soldiers fancied that they were foes and had done this on purpose to deceive them. At the same moment the centurion, Lucius Fabius, and the men who had climbed the wall along with him were surrounded and killed, and their bodies pitched down from the wall. Marcus Petronius, a centurion of the same legion, made an attempt to hew down the gates, but overwhelmed by numbers, desperate and covered with wounds, he said to the men of his company who had followed him, Since I cannot save myself and you, I will at all events try to save your lives, for it was I, in my lust for glory, who brought you into danger. You have your chance. Use it. With these words he dashed in among the enemy, killed two of them, and forced the rest back a little way from the gate his men attempted to help him. It's useless, he cried, for you to try and save my life, for blood and strength are ebbing. Go then, while you have the chance, and return to your legion. So he fought, and soon fell, and so he saved his men. Chapter 51 
overborne at every point, the Romans were driven from their position with the loss of forty-six centurions. The Gauls were relentlessly pursuing when the tenth legion, which had taken post in reserve on comparatively favourable ground, checked them, and the tenth was in its turn supported by the cohorts of the thirteenth, which had quitted the smaller camp under Titus Sextius, and occupied a commanding position. The moment the legions reached the plain they halted and showed a bold front to the enemy, and Vercingetorix withdrew his men from the foot of the hill into his entrenchments. Nearly seven hundred men were lost that day. End of chapter 52 7. Chapters 52 to 71 of Commentaries on the Gallic War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ted Garvin. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book 7. Chapter 52. Next day, Caesar paraded his troops and reprimanded them for the rashness and impetuosity which they had shown in judging for themselves how far they were to advance and what they were to do, not halting when the signal was given for recall and refusing to submit to the control of the tribunes and the generals. He explained that an unfavorable position made a serious difference. He had experienced this himself at Avaricum when though he had had the enemy in his grasp without their general and without their cavalry, he had foregone an assured triumph for fear that the unfavorable ground should entail a loss, however slight, in the action. He highly admired their heroic spirit, which entrenched camp and high mountain and walled fortresses were powerless to daunt, but just as hardly he reprobated their contempt for discipline and their presumption in imagining that they knew how to win battles and forecast results better than their general. He required from his soldiers obedience and self-control just as much as courage and heroism. 53. After this harangue, Caesar, in conclusion, encouraged the men, telling them not to let an incident like this trouble them, and not to ascribe to the enemy's courage a result which had been brought about by the unfavorable nature of the ground. His attention of abandoning Georgia being unchanged, he led their legions out of camp and formed them in line of battle on a good position. Still, Vercingetorix did not venture down on to the level. A cavalry skirmish followed, which resulted in favor of the Romans, and Caesar then withdrew his army into camp. Next day he fought a similar action, and then, thinking that he had done enough to humble the vainglory of the Gauls and to restore the confidence of his soldiers, he marched for the country of the Adui. Even then the enemy did not pursue. Two days later Caesar repaired a bridge over the Allier and threw his army across. 54. At this stage the Aeduans, Viridiomerus and Epidorix, approached and accosted him. He learned that Litavicus had gone off with all the cavalry to work upon the Adui. It was essential, they urged, that they should be beforehand, in order to keep the tribe steady. By this time Caesar saw clearly from many signs that the Adui were traitors, and he was of opinion that the departure of these men would hasten their defection. Still, he did not think it right to detain them for he desired to avoid the semblance of injustice and not lay himself open to the suspicion of fear. As they were leaving, he told them briefly what he had done for the Adui, pointing out how they were situated and how low they had fallen when his connection with them began. Driven into their strongholds, their lands confiscated and their allies all taken from them, tribute imposed upon them and hostages wrung from them with the grossest insults. Then how he had raised them to such prosperity and power that they not only regained their former position, but acquired, in the sight of all, a prestige and influence which they had never enjoyed before. With this reminder he let them go. 55. There was a Neduan town, advantageously situated on the banks of the Loire, called Noviodunum. Thither Caesar had conveyed all the hostages of Gaul, his grain, the public monies, and a large portion of his own baggage and that of the army. Thither, too, he had sent a large number of horses, which he had purchased in Italy and Spain for the war. On reaching the town, Epo Rhodorix and Viridio Maris ascertained the attitude of their tribe. Litovicius had been received by the Edui at Bebracte, the most influential town in the country. Convictor Latidus, the first magistrate, and a large proportion of the council had assembled to meet him, and envoys had been officially dispatched to Vercingetorix to effect a friendly understanding. An opportunity like this, they thought, was not to be missed. Accordingly, they massacred the guard at Noviodunum, 
and the individuals who had settled there for trade, and divided the treasure and the horses, arranged for the conveyance of the hostages of the several tribes to the magistrate of Bracte, burned the town, which they considered it impossible to hold, to prevent its being of use to the Romans, carried away in barges as much grain as they could hurriedly stow away, and threw the rest into the river or burned it. They then proceeded to raise forces from the neighboring districts, establishing detachments and piquets along the banks of the Loire, and throwing out cavalry in all directions to terrorize the Romans, in the hope of being able to prevent them from getting corn, or to drive them, under stress of destitution, to make for the province. It was a strong point in their favor that the Loire was swollen from the melting of the snow, so that, to all appearance, it was quite unfordable. 56. On learning this, Caesar decided that he must act at once so that, in case it should be necessary to take the risk of bridging the river, he might be able to fight before reinforcements came up. To change his whole plan of campaign and march for the province, that he deemed was a course to which he ought not to allow even the pressure of fear to force him. For the disgrace and the humiliation of retreat, the barrier interposed by the Savens, and the condition of the roads forbade him to attempt it and above all he was intensely anxious for Labinus, who was separated from him, and for the legions which he had placed under his command. Accordingly he made a series of extraordinary marches by day and night, reached the Loire before any one had expected him, and discovered a ford by the help of the cavalry, which was good enough for an emergency, the men being just able to keep their arms and shoulders above water, to carry their weapons. The cavalry were formed in line to break the force of the current, and, the enemy flying in confusion at the first sight of the army, he brought it safely across. Having satisfied its wants with corn and large numbers of cattle, which he found in the district, he pushed on for the country of the Senones. 57. While Caesar was engaged in these operations, Labinus marched for Lutitia with his four legions, leaving the draft which had recently arrived from Italy at Agadincum to protect the heavy baggage. Lutetia is a town belonging to the Parisi, situated on an island in the river San. When the enemy became aware of his approach, large forces assembled from the neighboring tribes. The chief command was conferred upon an Olerkin named Camelogenus, who, though old and worn, was called to this high place because of his uncommon knowledge of war. Observing that there was a continuous march, which drained into the Seine and rendered the whole country in its neighborhood impassable, he took post behind it and prepared to stop our men from crossing. 58. Labinus at first formed a line of sheds and attempted to fill up the marsh with fascines and other material and thus make a causeway across. Finding this scarcely practicable, he silently quitted his camp in the third watch and made his way, by the route by which he had advanced, to Meteocentum, a town belonging to the Senones, situated like Lutetia, of which we have just spoken, on an island in the Seine. Labinus seized about fifty barges, rapidly lashed them together, and threw the troops onto them. The townspeople, many of whom had been summoned into the field, were paralyzed with astonishment and fear, and Labinus took the town without a blow. After repairing the bridge, which the enemy had recently broken down, he made the army cross over, and marched on, following the course of the stream, in the direction of Lutetia. The enemy, informed of what he had done by fugitives from Meteocidum, gave orders that Lutetia should be burned and its bridges broken down. Then, moving away from the marsh, they encamped on the banks of the Seine, opposite Lutetia, and over against the camp of Labinus. 59. By this time it was known that Caesar had abandoned his position at Gergovia. By this time, too, rumors were arriving about the defection of the Adui and the success of the Gallic insurrection, and the Gauls, in their gossip with the Romans, affirmed that Caesar was prevented from pursuing his march and from crossing the Loire, and that one of corn had forced him to make a dash for the province. The Bellavaci, moreover, who were already and spontaneously disaffected, on learning that the Adui had gone over, began to raise troops and to make overt preparations for war. Now that the situation had so completely changed, Labinus saw that he must completely alter his original plan. What he thought of now was not how to gain some positive advantage and force the enemy to an engagement, but how to get his army safely back to Agedincum. On one side he was menaced by the Velovaci, who have the greatest reputation, as fighting men, of any tribe in Gaul. On the other, Camelogenus held the field with a well-formed army, ready for action, while a great river separated the legions from their baggage and the troops which protected it. With these formidable difficulties suddenly confronting him, he saw that he must look for aid to the force of his own character. 60. Towards evening he assembled his officers, and charging them to carry out his orders to the letter, 
placed one of the Roman knights in charge of each of the barges which he had brought down from Meteocetum, and ordered them to move silently four miles downstream at the end of the first watch, and wait for him there. Leaving five cohorts, which he believed to be the least steady in action, to hold the camp, he ordered the remaining five of the same legion to move up the river about midnight with the whole baggage train, and make a great noise. He also procured a number of small boats, and sent them in the same direction, the roarers making a great splash with their oars. Soon afterwards he silently moved out of the camp with three legions, and made for the spot to which he had ordered the barges to be rowed. 61. When the legions reached the spot, the enemy's patrols were surprised at their post all along the river by our troops, for a great storm had sprung up suddenly, and cut down. Infantry and cavalry were swiftly ferried across under the superintendence of the Roman knights, whom Labienus had charged with the duty. Just before dawn, and almost simultaneously, the enemy were informed that an unusual commotion was going on in the Roman camp, that a large column was moving up the river, and that the sound of oars audible in the same direction, and that troops were being ferried across a little lower down. On hearing this, they imagined that the legions were crossing at three places, and that the Romans, in alarm at the defection of the Aedui, were all preparing for flight. Accordingly, they made a corresponding distribution of their own troops, leaving a force opposite the Roman camp, and sending a small body in the direction of Meteocetum, with orders to advance as far as the boats had gone, they led the rest of their troops against Labinus. 62. By daybreak the whole of our troops were ferried across, and the enemy's line was discernible. Labinus, bidding the soldiers remember their ancient valor and their many splendid victories, and imagine that Caesar, under whose command they had many times beaten the enemy, was present in person, gave the signal for action. At the first onset, the right wing, where the seventh legion stood, drove back the enemy and put them to flight. The twelfth legion occupied the left. There the enemy's foremost ranks fell, transfixed by javelins. But the other ranks vigorously resisted, and not a man laid himself open to the suspicion of cowardice. Camelogenus, the enemy's commander, supported his men by his presence and cheered them on. And now, when the victory was still doubtful, the tribunes of the seventh legion, who had been told of what was passing on the left wing, made the legion show itself on the enemy's rear, and charged. Even in that moment not a man quitted his post, but all were surrounded and slain. Camelogenus shared their fate. The detachment which had been left on guard opposite Labinus' camp, on hearing that the battle had begun, went to the support of their comrades, and occupied a hill. But they could not withstand the onset of our victorious soldiery. Mingling with their flying comrades, they were slain, all who failed to find shelter in the woods and on the hills, by the Roman cavalry. Labinus' task was accomplished. He returned to Agadincum, where he had left the heavy baggage of the whole army, and thence made his way, with his entire force, to the quarters of Caesar. 63. When the defection of the Aedui became known, the gravity of the war increased. Embassies were dispatched in all directions. The Aedui, exerting all their influence, prestige, and pecuniary resources to win over the tribes, and, having in their power the hostages whom Caesar had left in their country, they intimidated waverers by threatening to kill them. They requested Vercingetorix to visit them and concert with them a plan of campaign, and when he complied they insisted that the supreme control should be transferred to them. The demand was disputed, and a pan-Gallic council was convened at Bibracte. Delegates flocked thither in numbers. The question was put to the vote, and the delegates unanimously confirmed the appointment of Vercingetorix as commander-in-chief. The Remi, Lingones, and Treveri were not represented in the council the two former because they adhered to their friendship with the Romans, the Treveri because they were far away and were themselves hard-pressed by the Germans, for which reason they kept aloof all through the war and remained neutral. The Adui, bitterly chagrined at being ousted from the supremacy, lamented their change of fortune and solely missed Caesar's favor. Yet having taken up arms, they dared not sever themselves from the other tribes. Reluctantly, those ambitious young leaders, Epidorix, Viridomarus, obeyed Vercingetorix. 64. The commander-in-chief ordered the newly joined tribes to give hostages, fixing a date for their arrival, and directed all the cavalry, numbering 15,000, to assemble speedily. He announced that he would content himself with the infantry which he had already, and would not tempt fortune by fighting a battle, for, as he was strong in cavalry, it would be quite easy to prevent the Romans from getting corn and forage, only let the patriots destroy their own corn and burn their homesteads in the certainty that by this personal sacrifice they were securing independence and liberty forevermore. Having made these arrangements, he ordered the Aedui and the Segusiavi, who were contemporaneous 
with the province to furnish ten thousand cavalry which he reinforced by eight hundred cavalry and placing the epidorix brother in command directed him to attack the Alaborges. in another quarter he sent the gabali and the arvernian clans nearest to the helvi to attack that people and the rutini and caderci to devastate the territory of the volca eromici at the same time he attempted by secret emissaries and embassies to gain over the Alaborges, promising money to the leading men and to the tribe domination over the whole province for he hoped that they had not yet forgotten the late war 65 to meet these emergencies there were detachments in readiness amounting to twenty-two cohorts which had been raised by lucius caesar a general officer from the whole province and were posted to meet every attack the helvi who encountered the neighboring clans on their own initiative were defeated with the loss of gaius valerius domitorus the first magistrate and many others and forced to take refuge in strongholds and behind walls the Alabroges posted a chain of pickets along the rhone and defended their own territory with great care and vigilance caesar being aware of the enemy's superiority in cavalry and unable to get any assistance from the province and italy as all the roads were blocked sent across the rhine to the tribes of germany which he had subdued in former years and called into the field cavalry with the light-armed foot which habitually fight in their ranks on their arrival as their horses were unserviceable he took those of the tribunes and other roman knights and also of the time expired volunteers and assigned them to the germans sixty six during these operations the enemy's arvernian forces and the cavalry levied from the whole of gaul were assembling Vercingetorix collected a large number of these troops and while caesar was marching through the most distant part of the country of the ligones toward the country of the sequani that he might be in a better position for reinforcing the province took post in three camps about ten miles from the romans summoning his cavalry officers to a council of war he told them that the hour of victory had come the romans were retreating to the province and abandoning gaul this was secure liberty for the time but for lasting peace and tranquillity the gain was small for they would come back in increased force and continue the war indefinitely the cavalry then must attack them on the march while they were helpless if the infantry stopped to support their comrades they could not continue their march if as he thought more likely they abandoned their baggage and tried to save themselves they would lose indispensable materiel as well as prestige as for the enemy's cavalry they at any rate ought not to doubt that not a man of them would dare so much as stir outside the column to encourage them in their attack he would post all his troops in front of the camps and over all the enemy with one voice the knights exclaimed that every man must be sworn by a solemn oath to ride twice through the enemy's column or never be admitted beneath the roof never come nigh unto children or parents or wife sixty seven the proposal was approved and every man was sworn next day the cavalry were divided into three sections two of which made a demonstration on either flank while the third checked the advance of the vanguard when the movement was reported caesar in turn divided his cavalry into three parts and ordered them to advance against the enemy the combat became general the column halted and the baggage was brought into the intervals between the legions when at any point our men appeared to be in difficulties or actually overmatched caesar made the infantry advance in their direction and form in line these tactics prevented the enemy from following up their advantage and encouraged our men by the assurance of support at length the germans occupied the summit of a ridge on the right flank dislodged the enemy and drove them in rout with heavy loss to a stream where Vercingetorix had taken post with his infantry observing this the rest of the cavalry were afraid of being surrounded and took to flight the whole field was a scene of carnage three aduans of the highest rank were brought prisoners to caesar codus coming down the cavalry who had disputed the claims of convictio litavus at the recent election cavarillus who had taken command of the infantry after the defection of litavicus eporodorix who had commanded the Adui in their war with the sequani before caesar's arrival sixty eight after the total defeat of his cavalry vercingetorix withdrew his infantry from the position which he had taken up in front of the camps and ordering his baggage train to leave camp quickly and follow him marched forthwith for elysia a stronghold of the mandubi caesar removed his baggage to a hill close by and leaving two legions to guard it kept up the pursuit as long as daylight permitted killing about three thousand of the enemy's rearguard and encamped next day in the neighborhood of elysia the enemy were cowed by the defeat of their cavalry the arm in which they had their greatest confidence 
Accordingly, after connoitering the position, he called upon the soldiers to brace themselves for an effort, and proceeded to form a contravallation. 69. The fortress stood on top of a hill, in a very commanding position, being apparently impregnable, except by blockade. The base of the hill was washed on two sides by two streams. In front of the town extended a plain about three miles in length, and on every other side it was surrounded, at a moderate distance, by hills of elevation equal to its own. Toward the wall, on the side of the hill which looked towards the east, the whole space was crowded with the Gallic troops, who had fortified it with a ditch and a wall of loose stones, six feet high. The perimeter of the works which the Romans were about to construct covered eleven miles. Camps were established in convenient positions, and in their neighborhood twenty-three rodults were constructed, in which pickets were posted during the day, to prevent any sudden sortie, while at night they were guarded by strong bivouacs. 70. After the commencement of the works, a cavalry combat took place in the plain which, as we have explained above, formed a gap in the hills, extending three miles in length. Both sides fought their hardest. As our men were in difficulties, Caesar sent the Germans to support them, and drew up the legions in front of the camps to prevent any sudden attack by the enemy's infantry. Supported by the legions, our men gathered confidence. The enemy were put to flight, and hampered by their own numbers, got jammed in the gateways, which had been left too narrow. The Germans hotly pursued them right up to the entrenchments. The carnage was great, and some of the fugitives dismounted and tried to cross the ditch and climb over the wall. Caesar ordered the legions which he had drawn up in front of the ramparts to advance a little. The Gauls, inside the entrenchments, were not less terrified than the fugitives, and believing that they would speedily be attacked, shouted, Two arms! while some rushed panic-stricken into the town. Vercingetorix ordered the gates to be shut, to prevent the camp from being deserted, and the Germans, having killed a great many men and captured a number of horses, returned. 71. For Senatorix now determined to send away all his cavalry in the night before the Romans had time to complete the entrenchments. As they were moving off, he bade them go, every man to his own country, and make all who were of an age to bear arms take the field. Reminding them of his own services, he adjured them to have some regard for his safety and not to give up one who had served so well the cause of national liberty to be tortured by the enemy. If they did not bestir themselves, he told them, 80,000 picked men would perish with him. He calculated that he had corn enough to last barely 30 days, but by reducing the rations it might be possible to hold out a little longer. With these instructions he silently sent out the cavalry, and the second watch, through a gap in the works. He ordered all the grain to be brought to him, giving notice that those who disobeyed should be put to death, distributed the livestock, of which a great quantity had been driven in by the Mandubi, individually among the garrison, made arrangements for doling out the grain gradually, and withdrew into the town all the forces which he had posted in front of it. In this way he prepared to fight on and await the Gallic reinforcements. End of chapter 71 Chapters 72 to 90 of Commentaries on the Gallic War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ted Garvin. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book 7, Chapter 72. Being informed of what had passed by deserters and prisoners, Caesar planned defensive works of the following kind. Constructing a trench twenty feet wide with vertical sides, the width at the bottom being exactly equal to the distance between its upper edges, he traced out all the remaining works eight hundred paces behind it, his object being, as he was obliged to cover such a vast extent of ground and it was not easy to man the whole system of works with an unbroken ring of troops, to prevent the enemy from swooping down unexpectedly upon the lines in force at night, or in the daytime discharging missiles at the men while they were at work. Leaving this interval, he dug two trenches of equal depth, each fifteen feet wide, and filled the inner one, where it crossed the plain and the low ground, with water drawn from the stream. Behind the trenches he constructed a rampart and palisade twelve feet high, which he strengthened by an embattled breastwork with large forked branches projecting along the line where the breastwork joined the rampart, to check the ascent of the enemy, and erected towers 
on the entire circuit of the works at intervals of eighty feet. Chapter 73 While these vast fortifications were being constructed, it was necessary to fetch timber and corn, and the troops, having to move considerable distances from camp, were unavoidably weakened. Sometimes, indeed, the Gauls attempted to storm our works and made furious sallies from the town by several gates. Caesar therefore thought it necessary to strengthen the works still further in order to render the lines defensible by a smaller force. Accordingly, trees or very stout branches were cut down and their ends stripped of their bark and sharpened to a point. Continuous trenches were then dug, five feet deep, in which the logs were planted and fastened down at the bottom to prevent their being dragged out, while the boughs projected above. There were five rows in each trench, connected with one another and interlaced, and all who stepped in would impale themselves on the sharp stakes. The men called them gravestones. In front of them, arranged in slanting rows in the form of a quincux, pits were dug, three feet deep, which tapered gradually toward the bottom. Smooth logs as thick as a man's thigh, sharpened at the top and hardened by fire, were planted in them, projecting not more than four fingers above the ground. At the same time, the earth was trampled down to the depth of one foot above the bottom, to keep them firmly in position, while the rest of the pit was covered with twigs and brushwood to hide the trap. There were eight rows of this kind, three feet apart. The men called them lilies, from their resemblance to that flower. In front of them, blocks of wood, a foot long, with barbed iron spikes let into them, were completely buried in the earth and scattered about in all directions at moderate intervals. The men called them spurs. Chapter 74 When these defenses were completed, Caesar constructed, along the most suitable tracks which the lie of the country enabled him to follow, embracing a circuit of fourteen miles, corresponding works of the same kind, facing the opposite way, to repel the enemy from without, so as to prevent the troops who defended the lines from being hemmed in by any force, however numerous, and in order to avoid the danger of having to leave camp, he directed all the troops to provide themselves with fodder and corn for thirty days. Chapter 75 While this was going on at Elysia, the Gauls convened a council of their leading men, who decided not to adopt for Sinecurix's plan of assembling all who could bear arms, but to levy a definite contingent from each tribe for they were afraid that with such a vast multitude crowding together they would not be able to control their respective contingents or keep them apart or to organize any system for providing grain the edui with their dependents the segusiavi ambivareti and alerci branovices were ordered to find thirty five thousand men the averni along with the alutieri carducci gabali and velavi who are habituated to their sway. The same number, the Sequani, Sinones, Biterigis, Santoni, Rutini, and Carnutes, each 12,000, the Bellovaci, 10,000, and the Lemovices, the same, the Pictones, Turoni, Parisi, and Helvetii, each 8,000, the Andes, Ambiani, Mediomatrici, Petrocori, Nervi, Morini and Nitio Broges, each six thousand, the Alerci Kenomani, five thousand, and the Atrobats the same, the Velocheces, four thousand, the Alerci Eburovices, three thousand, the Rarici and Boi, each two thousand, and all the maritime tribes conjointly, which the Gauls usually call Armorican, including the Coriosolites, Redones, and Bivari. Caletes, Osimi, Veneti, Lemovices, and Venelli, 30,000. The Bellovaci did not furnish their proper contingent, saying that they would fight the Romans on their own account, just as they pleased, and not submit to the dictation of any one. However, at the request of Calmius, and in consideration of their friendly relations with him, they sent 2,000 men along with the rest. Chapter 76 Caesar, as we have already mentioned, had found Commius a loyal and serviceable agent in former years in Britain, and in acknowledgment of these services, he had granted his tribe immunity from taxation, restored to it its rights and laws, and placed the Morini under his authority. 
yet so intense was the unanimous determination of the entire gallic people to establish their liberty and recover their ancient military renown that no favors no recollection of former friendship had any influence with them but all devoted their energies and resources to the prosecution of the war eight thousand horse and about two hundred and fifty thousand foot were raised they were reviewed and numbered in the country of the Adui, and their officers appointed the atrebatian commius the two Aduans, Virodomarus and Epirodorix, and Vercassivellanus, an Arvernian and kinsman of Vercingetorix, were entrusted with the command. Delegates from the various tribes were associated with them, in accordance with whose advice they were to conduct the campaign. All started for Elysia in high spirits and full of confidence, and there was not one of them who did not believe that the mere appearance of so vast a host would be irresistible especially as the fighting would be on two fronts the besieged sallying forth from the town while without would be conspicuous those huge hosts of cavalry and infantry chapter seventy seven but the besieged in elysia knew nothing of what was going on in the country of the adui the day on which they had expected their countrymen to succour them was past and their grain was all consumed a council of war was therefore convened and they considered what was to become of them various opinions were mooted some advised surrender others assorted while their strength held out but critognatus an arvenian of noble family and acknowledged influence made a speech which in view of its singular and atrocious cruelty ought not i think to be passed over i do not intend he said to notice the view of those who dignified the most abject slavery by the title of surrender for i hold that they ought not to be counted as citizens or admitted to a council i am only concerned with those who are in favour of a sortie for as you are all agreed in their council is to be recognised the memory of our ancient valour to be unable to bear privation for a short span that i call weakness not manly resolution it is easier to find men who will affront death than men who will patiently endure suffering and yet i would give my sanction to this view so highly do i respect the authority of its advocates if i saw no evil involved in it save the sacrifice of our own lives but in forming our plans we must have regard to the whole of gaul for we have called upon the whole of gaul to help us if eighty thousand men fall on one field what think you will be the feelings of our friends and kinsmen when they are constrained to fight almost on the very corpses of the slain to save you they have counted their personal danger as nothing do not then rob them of your aid do not by your folly and rashness or lack of resolution ruin the whole of gaul and subject it to perpetual slavery can it be that because they have not arrived punctually to the day you doubt their good faith and resolution what then do you suppose that the romans are toiling day after day on those outer lines simply to amuse themselves if the messengers of your countrymen cannot reassure you because all ingress is barred except roman testimony that their coming is near dread of that event keeps them busy upon their works night and day what then is my counsel i counsel you to do what our fathers did in their war with the cimbri and teutoni a war in no way comparable to this forced into their strongholds and brought low like us by famine they kept themselves alive by feeding upon the flesh of those whose age disqualified them for war but they did not surrender to the enemy and if we had no precedent for this still in the name of liberty i would hold it a most glorious precedent to create and bequeath to posterity for what resemblance was there between that war and this the cambri devastated gaul and brought upon her grievous calamity but they did at last leave our country and seek other lands they did leave us our rights our laws our lands our liberty but the romans what aim what purpose have they but this from mere envy to settle in these lands and tribal territories of a people whose renown and warlike prowess they have come to know and to fasten upon them the yoke of everlasting slavery never have they made war on any other principle if you know not what is going on among distant peoples look at the gaul on your border reduced to a province its rights and laws revolutionized prostrate beneath the lictor's axe it is cr crushed by perpetual slavery chapter seventy eight the votes were recorded it was decided that those whose age or infirmity disqualified them from fighting should leave the town that the rest should try every expedient before having recourse to critonatus proposal 
but that if circumstances were too strong and the reinforcements delayed they should adopt it rather than stoop to accept terms of surrender or peace the mandubi who had admitted them into the town were compelled to leave with their wives and children when they reached the lines they earnestly entreated the romans with tears to receive them as slaves only give them something to eat but caesar posted guards on the rampart and forbade them admission chapter seventy nine meanwhile commius and the other leaders who had been entrusted with the command reached elysia with their whole force and occupying a hill outside encamped not more than a mile from our entrenchments next day they moved their cavalry out of camp occupied the whole plain which as we have shown extends three miles in length and drawing back their infantry a little posted them on the high ground the town of elysia commanded a view over the plain descrying the reinforcements the besieged crowded it together and congratulated each other and all were joyfully excited leading their forces to the front they took post before the town, filled up the nearest trench with vaccines covered with earth, and made ready for a sortie and for every hazard. Chapter 80 Disposing his whole force on both lines of entrenchment, so that every man might know his proper place and keep it, ready for emergencies, Caesar ordered the cavalry to move out of camp and engage. All the camps which crowned the surrounding heights commanded a view of the field and all the soldiers were intently awaiting the issue of the combat here and there among their the cavalry the gauls had scattered archers and active light armed foot to support their comrades in case they gave way and withstand the charges of our cavalry a good many men were wounded by these troops whose attack they had not foreseen and left the field feeling sure that their countrymen were winning and observing that our men were being overpowered by numbers the beleaguered Gauls, as well as those who had come to rescue them, cheered and yelled on every side to encourage their comrades. As the fighting was going on in full view of every one, and no gallant deed, no cowardice, could escape notice, love of glory and fear of disgrace stimulated both sides to valor. From noon till near sunset the fight went on, and still the issue was doubtful. At length the Germans massed their squadrons at one point, and charged and forced back the enemy, and on their flight the archers were surrounded and slain. The other divisions likewise falling back, our men gave them no chance of rallying, but pursued them right up to their encampment. The besieged, who had sallied forth from Elysia, well nigh despairing of success, sadly retreated into the town. Chapter 81 An interval of one day followed, during which the Gauls made a great quantity of fascines, ladders, and grappling hooks fixed to long poles. At midnight they moved silently out of camp, and advanced to the entrenchments in the plain. Suddenly they raised a shout to inform the besieged of their approach, and began to throw their fascines, to drive the Romans from the rampart with slings, arrows, and stones, and in every other way to press the attack. Simultaneously, verse Syndicatorix, hearing the distant cry, sounded the trumpet and led his men out of the town. Our troops moved up to the entrenchments, in the places which had been severally allotted to them beforehand, and drove back the Gauls with slings throwing large stones, and sharp stakes which they had laid at intervals on the rampart, and with bullets. The darkness made it impossible to see clearly, and on both sides many were wounded, while missiles were hurled in showers by the artillery. Two generals, Mark Antony and Gaius Trebonius, who had been charged with the defense of this part of the lines, withdrew troops from the distant redoubts, and reinforced our men at every point where they saw them overmatched. Chapter 82 So long as the Gauls kept at a distance from the entrenchments, the number of their missiles gave them the advantage, but when they came closer, some trod unawares upon the spurs, others tumbled into the pits and impaled themselves, while others were transfixed by heavy pikes from the rampart and towers, and perished. Everywhere they suffered heavy loss, and at no point did they break the lines. Toward daybreak, fearing that they might be attacked from the higher camps on their exposed flank and surrounded, they fell back and rejoined their comrades. The besieged lost much time in bringing out the implements which Vercinicorix had prepared for the sortie, and in filling up the nearer trench, and finding, before they could approach the contravalation, that their comrades had withdrawn they went back unsuccessful to the town. Chapter 83 Having been twice repulsed with heavy loss, the Gauls considered what was to be done. 
they called in natives who were familiar with the ground and ascertained from them the position of the higher camps and the nature of their fortifications there was a hill on the north which had such a wide sweep that the romans had not been able to include it within the circumvallation and were obliged to make the camp there on a gentle slope which gave an assailant a slight advantage this camp was garrisoned by two legions under the command of two generals gaius anstitius reginus and caius caninius rebilus after making a reconnaissance the hostile leaders selected from the whole force sixty thousand men belonging to the tribes which had the highest reputation for valor secretly decided on their plan of operations and fixed the attack for noon Vercassivellanus, an Arvernian, one of the four generals in a relation of Vercingetorix, was placed in command of the force. He left camp in the first watch. Towards daybreak he had almost finished his march, and concealing himself behind the hill, he ordered his soldiers to rest after the toil of the night. Towards noon he pushed on for the camp mentioned above, and simultaneously the cavalry began to move towards the entrenchments in the plain, while the rest of the host made a demonstration in front of their camp. Chapter 84 Descrying his countrymen from the citadel of Elysia, Vercingetorix moved out of the town, taking from the camp the long pikes, sappers' huts, grappling hooks, and other implements which he had prepared for the sortie. Fighting went on simultaneously at every point, and the besieged tried every expedient, concentrating their strength on the weakest points. The Roman forces, being strung out over lines of vast extent, found it hard to move to several points at once. The shouts of the combatants in their rear had a serious effect in unnerving the men, who saw that their own lives were staked upon the courage of others, for men are generally disquieted most by the unseen. Chapter 85 Caesar found a good position from which he observed all the phases of the action and reinforced those who were in difficulties. Both sides saw that now was the moment for a supreme effort. The Gauls utterly despaired of safety unless they could break the lines. The Romans, if they could but hold their ground, looked forward to the end of all their toils. The struggle was most severe at the entrenchments on the high ground, against which, as we have remarked, for Cassivellaunus had been sent. The unfavorable downward slope told heavily. Some of the assailants showered in missiles, while others locked their shields above their heads, and advanced to the assault, and when they were tired, fresh men took their places. The entire force shot earth against the fortifications, which at once enabled the Gauls to ascend and bury the obstacles which the Romans had hidden in the ground, and now weapons, and strength to use them, were failing our men. Chapter 86 On learning the state of affairs, Caesar sent Labinus, with six cohorts to rescue the hard-pressed garrison, telling him, in case he could not hold on, to lead out the cohorts in charge, but only as a forlorn hope. Visiting the other divisions in person, he adjured them not to give in. On that day, he told them, on that hour was staked the prize of all past combats. The besieged, abandoning the hope of forcing the formidable works in the plain, took the implements which they had prepared and attempted to storm a deep ascent. With a hail of missiles they drove off the men who defended the towers, filled up the trenches with earth and fascines, and with their grappling hooks tore down the rampart and breastworks. Chapter 87 Caesar first sent the younger Brutus with a number of cohorts, and afterwards Gaius Fabius with others. Finally, as the fighting grew fiercer, he led a fresh detachment in person to the rescue. Having restored the battle and beaten off the enemy, he hastened to the point to which he had dispatched Labinus, withdrawing four cohorts from the nearest redoubt, and ordering part of the cavalry to follow him and part to ride round the outer lines and attack the enemy in the rear. Labinus, finding that neither rampart nor trench could check the enemy's onslaught, massed eleven cohorts, which he was fortunately able to withdraw from the nearest piquets, and sent messengers to let Caesar know what he intended. Caesar hastened to take part in the action. Chapter 88 The enemy knew that he was coming from the color of his cloak, which he generally wore in action to mark his identity, and catching sight of the cohorts and troops of cavalry which he had ordered to follow him, descending the incline, which was plainly discernible from their commanding position, began the attack. 
both sides raised a cheer and the cheering was taken up along the rampart and the whole extent of the lines our men dropped their javelins and plied their swords suddenly the cavalry was seen on the enemy's rear the fresh cohorts came up the enemy turned tail and the cavalry charged the fugitives the carnage was great sedulius commander and chieftain of the Mavicis, was slain Vercassa Vellanus the Arvernian was taken alive as he was trying to escape. Seventy-four standards were brought to Caesar, and few of that mighty host got safely back to camp. Descrying from the town the slaughter and the rout of their countrymen, the besieged in despair recalled their troops from the entrenchments. Hearing this, the Gauls in camp forthwith fled, and if the soldiers had not been tired out by frequent supporting movements and by the whole day's toil, the enemy's entire host might have been annihilated. The cavalry were dispatched about midnight and hung about upon the rear guard. A large number were captured and slain. The rest escaped and went off to their respective tribes. Chapter 89 Next day Vercingetorix called a council. He explained that he had undertaken the war not for private ends, but in the cause of national freedom, and since they must needs bow to fortune, he would submit to whichever alternative they preferred, either to appease the Romans by putting him to death, or to surrender him alive. Envoys were sent to refer the question to Caesar. He ordered the arms to be surrendered and the leaders brought out. The officers were conducted to the entrenchment in front of his camp, where he was seated. Vercingetorix surrendered and the arms were grounded. Caesar allotted one prisoner by way of prize to every man in the army, making an exception in favor of the Adui and Arverni, as he hoped by restoring them to win back the two tribes. Chapter 90. These arrangements completed, he started for the country of the Adui, and received the submission of the tribe. Thither the Arverni sent envoys, promising to obey his orders, and he ordered them to furnish a large number of hostages. The legions were sent into winter quarters, and about 20,000 prisoners were stored to the Adui and Arverni. He directed Titus Labinus to march with two legions and a detachment of cavalry into the country of the Sequani, placing Marcus Sempronius Rutilus under his command, stationed Gaius Fabius and Lucius Minucius Basilus with two legions in the country of the Remi, to protect them from injury at the hands of their neighbors the Bellavaci, dispatched Gaius and Stitius Reginus into the country of the Ambivaretti, Titus Sextius into that of the Rituriges, and Gaius Cananius Rebilus into that of the Rutini, each in command of a legion, and quartered Quintus Tullius Cicero and Publius Suplicius in the country of the Adui at Cabillo and Metisco on the Saone, to collect grain. He decided to winter himself at Bibracte. When the results of the campaign were made known by his dispatches, a thanksgiving service of twenty days was held at Rome. End of chapter 90 End of Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes